My name is Madeline Hill and my husband and I moved to Ashland in 1972 after spending a couple years living in a Volkswagen camper and being hippies, traveling around Europe. After he, we, we moved to uh, the Los Santos area after we both graduated from college and I worked for Los Santos County Department of Public Social Services where my husband got his PhD. And before starting our family and deciding where we were permanently going to live, I thought, let's just do our traveling now before we get tied down to regular jobs. So we saved a bunch of money and flew to Germany in 1971 and got a little used camper and lived in that and traveled all around living in campgrounds, going to showering once a week. It, by a train station or a campground or something and found some relatives in Denmark, that, excuse me, relatives in Norway where, where my grandmother was from and visited my mother's cousins way up at, above the Arctic Circle in Nesna, Norway. They told me I had cousins in Denmark, so we visited them in Denmark and they told me that they, their, their son know that they needed a professor at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, so we were there in September, drove by the college took a chance, knocked on the door of the psychology department, and just that same day they hired my husband to teach in our host Denmark, so we got to stay there nine months, and it was a changing point in both our lives because what I was able to learn is comparing the social service delivery system and the healthcare system in Denmark to what I had seen in California, particularly with the welfare mothers and the, unwet, uh, the children that nobody wanted and the foster care children and abused children and handicapped children. And I came back, when we came back to the United States, I wanted to change from uh, dealing, helping handicapped children to dealing with seniors and incorporate some of the ideas that I had learned while we lived in Denmark. And because they were so far ahead of the United States at that time, and I think they still are in the healthcare system and how they take care of the older people and handicapped people and people with less, in, less education and less abilities. It's just wonderful what they did there. So I was a typical uh, housewife. I put my husband through graduate school rather than thinking of going myself. I just put him through because that's what girls did. I think in hindsight I probably could have been a wonderful lawyer or something like that, but nobody ever told me I could do that. So all I thought I could do was a teacher because I didn't know any better. And in the early 70s, 72, 73, uh, I was a social worker at the VA in White City. But again, I didn't like seeing people institutionalized. I thought people should not have to live in an institution like I had seen in Denmark, where people didn't have to live in the institutions as much as they have to do here. So I said, okay, if I'm a social worker, how, c and I can help one person one at a time, but how, how does change really happen? So I went to the Ashland Public Library because we didn't have computers in 72 and 73. So how how do you make a change if you don't have money and if you if you don't have a um, you're not a powerful person and you're not real rich what can you do differently? And I started reading and listening to public radio a little bit, public television, and just reading things about the women were women were thinking maybe women could do more than we thought they could do. And I noticed when I where I was working, my husband and I both worked for the VA federal government, but I was paying more into my health health insurance and more for my retirement program than he was. And why was that? Because I was a woman. And that didn't seem quite right that I should have to pay more than him. Why was that? Why was it different? And I started just paying attention. And I read something at the Ashton Library, a little notice about a women's consciousness raising group. I wonder what that is. So I got up my courage and went there. Uh, some brave women had started some con a consciousness raising group in Ashland. And I'm sitting there once a week with these other women and they were saying things like, well, what movies do you like? And I would say, well, we like. And where would you like to go to dinner? And I said, well, we like. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, I didn't know what I liked. I only knew what we liked. And I had grown up in a family where, where every everything was done together and, and well why hadn't I ever 
been out to dinner by myself to a restaurant. And why had I never done these things? By, not, I had a very good marriage. I've still just celebrated my 57th wedding anniversary yesterday. So I still have a very good marriage and a wonderful husband. But what's, what am I missing? And so I started reading things. I read, I read Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique. And all of a sudden, I saw myself in that book. And I'm still, I'm going to the consciousness raising groups and I'm reading this book. And I'm thinking, maybe my life could be a little different than what I thought. Maybe I don't have to just be a social worker working for somebody else. How can I change to make a difference? And a, then I started thinking about the National Organization for Women and reading about them and hearing about them and thinking, well, there's no chapter of the National Organization for Women in Southern Oregon. Well, why not? So I started reading their signing up. I sent them money and they sent me literature. I said, well, maybe we could start a chapter here. So we did. So there was a chap, we started the first chapter of the National Organization for Women in the Rogue Valley. And I said, well, we need a president and we need a board. Well, I couldn't do that. I'd never done anything like that. Well, maybe I could. And I had learned in our neighborhood that uh, there was, in Ashland, there was a, a land use decision that was going to happen. It was going to be, somebody wanted to just disrupt our, our little quiet neighborhood above the, above the park, up on the corner of Scenic and Nutley, where we lived. And how, I said, well, maybe we could do something to not have this happen. Maybe the, the people that wanted to get rich doing development wouldn't have to just destroy our neighborhood to do that. So I went to the library again and read about how how you make planning actions and how you deal with the city council. And pretty soon we were having meetings at our house to, with our neighbors to challenge what the city planning department wanted to do. And lo and behold, I was successful and I got up my courage and practiced with my women's, women's uh, consciousness raising group and got up my courage up and went to this, started writing letters and making presentations and all of a sudden there was a new amendment to Ashland City, first, their first planning code, it was called the Hill Amendment, after me. The Hill Amendment was to do with, uh, there was, the, where, the, where, where Scenic Drive and Nutley Drive meet, it's called a, a Grandview neighborhood, and there's a Grandview Drive and some very large houses up on Grandview, and as Nutley continued up into the hills above the Strawberry Lane area, that was just farms, great big farms, a, a few houses and great big farms and dirt, ro and dirt roads, Kneebone that area. And the city was going to just allow rampant growth up there without doing anything with the, the dirt roads or the, the strawberry lane, which was, was hard to get up and down, without really looking at any very good traffic, traffic uh, plans, traffic impact. And so uh, we, we thought that they should be, have to do some traffic impact, Im, traffic impact plans and research before they could go ahead and do that. And it, it was done, all of a sudden there was a change in the comprehensive plan map, but there were no minutes of meetings, there were no maps, all of a sudden it just changed. The planning, the, the comprehensive plan cha map changed with no, with no background information. And we, and I, fig I found that because I couldn't see, they couldn't justify where they had made, who, who had made the decisions to do that. I never did you know who made the decisions to change that map, but they didn't get away with it. So there was, there was a Hill Amendment to the Ashland's first comprehensive plan, and that was named after me because of what we, did. we were successful. And that was my first experience doing something political and being successful and being around other people who said, well, you could do this. And then we started doing more of the getting together with the, with the NOW group, and we started looking around at what was going on. And what was going on, you just read in the paper, um, at the university, there was a, a, a woman came to us, a young woman at the college came to us and said, well, this is, might seem silly, but in the PE department, in the girls in the PE department, they have to take their PE clothes home and wash them, and the boys get their clothes washed by the college for free, but the girls have to take theirs home. And, well, why is that? Well, because because they said, well, women like their clothes washed a certain kind of way and the men don't care. I said, well, that's ridiculous. So 
we went and talked to the university and they changed it. And then another uh, thing we, we read in the paper about, we, we had started going to ACLU meetings. And what do they, they, they were looking into women's issues in Ashland. There was an Ashland chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union and my husband ended up being on the board of the American Civil Liberties Union in Ashland. And so we're both kind of getting involved in these things. And we find out that at the, at the jail in Medford, the men have the men prisoners had could have three or four times a week where they could have visitors where their wives or their families could visit them, and the women only had one time a week where their family could visit them. So we went, I went and interviewed the jail people and said, "Well, why is that?" Well, that's because there's fewer women in the jail than men, so that the women's families could only visit them once a week, but the men's families could visit them several times. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So we met, we, several of us women met together with ACLU and we got that changed. And then it's time to look at, uh, there's this Ashland school, school board was gonna hire a new superintendent for the school board. So some women who were teachers in the school board come, came to the group of us who were meeting, the NOW group. We were starting to get kind of famous by then. People were paying attention to us. I think maybe we had a lot of fun marching in the Ashland Fourth of July parade. We had a, we started having we did floats and we had we marched in with much trepidation marching in our first parade that Ashland's famous Fourth of July parade with the National Organization for Women with costumes and plaques and banners and noisemakers and our kids and our spouses and our partners and people started paying attention. So I was back to um, the school situation. So the teachers were scared to do anything, but they said, nobody is advertising this. They're not posting this opportunity for either the principal vacancy for a principal or vacancy for the school superintendent position. At that time, there were zero women administrators in the Ashland School District. There were no women administrators at Southern Oregon University at a very high level. There were no women in the police department, no women in the fire department and no woman who had ever run for mayor of Ashland, let alone be mayor. So, so the teachers were kind of scared, so I wrote a little statement and stood up in front of this Ashland school board meeting. I don't have any children, but so I wasn't scared that anybody was gonna be able to hurt me, and said, why is it that you haven't posted this job anywhere except where the good old boys network? because there's some women here who have masters and PhDs already in your school system and they don't even know about this vacancy. And it, so as a result of that, they had to back down and start advertising it. And a, a group of women called Options uh, was uh, Nancy Peterson and Olive Strike got together and decided that they, we kind of forced the school district to start having some education for their administrators and their teachers about about gender equity and and the fact that their their lists of uh, history books and literature books there's hardly any written by women about women w women's history was missing in the school district so they started examining in the Ashland school district why that was and trying to educate the rest of them the rest of the school people about what how why that was important we now have since that time, just jumping into the educational system, we've had a, a woman president of the Southern Oregon University. We've had a woman superintendent of schools. We've had women principals. It wasn't that long ago that there were none, absolutely none. Now there are women in the fire departments, women in the police departments. One of the reasons there's women in the fire departments is we, we read in the paper that the Medford Fire Department was doing testing for how, who could be a firefighter. And from the now literature that we were looking at, we found, we realized that the reason that that the women weren't passing the physical agility tests of, for the fire department was that the men were the ones doing the testing. So we went out one morning in the cold to the place where the, all the male firefighters were doing their testing, and there were two women that were trying to be wanted to be testing. And we found we say, well, what you need to do is take your own tape measures and your own stopwatches and interview and watch how long it takes the women to do each of those activities as well as how long it takes the men. 
because what they were having the women do is lift up a very heavy ladder all by themselves where the men would tell us that it really takes two of us. We always just have two of us lifting this really high level ladder onto the side of the fire truck. It's not just one, what they're making them do. And because we were there, we got well, quite a bit of tension on, from, the, from the TV stations and the news stations, of course. And it made everybody aware of what was going on and it forced them in a subtle kind of way to start looking at why they were turning away all the women. And eventually it changed, but it, it takes somebody to, to shake you up. We realized that we had to start being more, much more public. We, we, had a, we even had a little underground group. I can't, I'm trying to remember what they were called. Uh, it was a group of older women. It was a group of women that helped us, the younger women, because we were in our 30s and 40s at the time, but there was a group of women in their 60s and 70s. They called themselves the Owls, the Older Women's League. Oh, the Owls were Josephine Roadhamel and Lois Newman. Oh, I, I, I have some of their names. I could find them names. Oh, they were just wonderful. Um, th they, one of them, one of them had been through the McCarthy era. They would had been through the McCarthy era, and they would tell us about the red baiting and the, the things that go on there. Another one was had been in the movie industry in Los Angeles, and would tell us about about what what that was like when they were in their twenties and thirties and going through that experience. Um, and they would they were the they were the most outrageous group of of women you could imagine. They were just wonderful. And they, they, were, they were meeting once a week in Ashland, and they would come to us and we'd give us ideas of what to do. So I remember one of their actions was they were watching a TV ad for a furniture store in Medford. And the furniture store had women sitting around in lingeries selling mattresses. So what the women did is they started calling up, calling up the furniture store and asking to talk to the lingerie department. <laughs> and the, what are you, why are you doing that? And so, well, why do you have this woman in scantily clad women in negligee, negligee selling your furniture? You're, you're, that's sexist. That's not, you're, that's not treating women with respect. And I was trying to remember all the other things that we used to do when we would see sexist ads and women that, ads that degraded women. We would, we would come and complain. One of the things we were able to do was with a Jackson, in Jackson County had an advertisement for in the newspaper for we we would start monitoring the help wanted ads in the newspaper. Still, we didn't have we didn't have internet and computers much then yet either. So you just read the help wanted in the newspaper, and one of them would say, "Help wanted mail, help wanted mail," and it would be for mowing the lawns and county properties, and you would. You just had to be able to push a lawnmower. You didn't have to be. You didn't have to be able to speak English. You didn't have to be able to type. You didn't have to have any education. You didn't have anything, and you would get this a certain salary. But then they would also advertise for, for clerical positions where you had to have, education, experience, skills, and you'd make less money than the person who just had to push a lawnmower. All of whom were male. And all the the clerical positions were all female, and we were able to pressure the Jackson County Commissioners into changing how they were advertising their jobs and make them more, make pay comparable to the kind of experience that one needed. And then we started getting involved in politics. This is still the National Organization for Women group again. Uh, and we saw that the Democratic Party was going to have a, was being taken over by some people that were wanting to not have, were against the Equal Rights Amendment for women, were against having uh, sex education for children and, and against uh, the right to choose. And we didn't want that plank in our democratic uh, platform here, so we studied up about parliamentary procedure. And several of us went to the democratic uh, weekend platform convention in Central Point. And we've, we were able to change what, what they were planning on doing because they had some people who were going to be pushing these planks against women's rights. So in, we used parliamentary procedure and 
questioned how the agenda was done and how the votes were counted and we just used all these parliamentary procedure ploys and there was nothing they could other side could do because we knew what we were doing and we we were able to then put me in as chairman of the human rights section of the plan there was there were letters to the editor afterwards who were those women from ashland where did they come from <laughs> we laughed and laughed and laughed uh, i'm just trying to remember all those uh, some of those other little sneaky things we did and we we realized that it doesn't also doesn't take very long to get on the front page of the paper in ashland because there's always a lot of news and so i wrote a letter to um to the 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 shakespeare the guild there that that was they they were uh, they would ever they would sell tarts and things uh, to raise money for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival the, during the intermission, and they could only they would only allow girls to be tart girls to sell. They, so this this group of supporters of the festival would only allow girls. And I said, well, that's not right. Little boys might want to be able to volunteer to to help money to raise money for the Shakespeare Festival as well. So they changed, it. but that that. That gave us a front page article in the newspaper. That was kind of fun. That wasn't that we got that. Well, we started raising. We started. We had a lot of fun being in the Ashton Fourth of July parade. And then we started having a booth in the Ashton Fourth of July parade. And one year we we um, all dressed up as Supreme Court justices. This was after um, the year when Sandra Day O'Connor was the first woman who was on the considered for the first woman to be on the the Supreme Court. So that was, so we thought that was pretty exciting. So so we got dressed up as Supreme Court justices. That was that was a fun one. And we go down to, through the parade and some people would boo, but almost everybody shouted and cheered and hooray and that was that was kind of fun. And the, along the way came uh, women in transition which was part of what something came out of the university and I wasn't too terribly involved in that. In back to my professional career uh, I thought, well, I don't want to just be a, a regular social worker anymore because I want to be able to make some political change. And I think, how, what do I need to do to change from just doing one-on-one -on -one counseling and social work types? Because I had read a, a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. And I'd had a wonderful supervisor in California who taught me about the magic of thinking big and how decisions are made. And as a social worker, you're always uh, having budget cuts and you're having services cut because people who are making these decisions are the bean counters, but they're not necessarily making the decisions based on what I thought was really what people needed. So she, she taught me about how you look at who, 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 who controls the money. And so what I decided to do was go, instead of getting a master's degree in social work, which was what I was going to do next, my husband was willing to move away and we would go get, I would go get my master's degree because I'd put him through his PhD. So I got all ready and I took the graduate record exam to, be, go, to go to a school of social work somewhere else. And I said, well, what can I do here? What do I need to do? So I took a year off, kind of like my own sabbatical, and I went to Southern Oregon University part-time and I took classes in political communication, accounting, and what was the third one? and computers, because those are things I thought that I needed to add to what I knew about being a caseworker if I was going to make a change. And so I did that for a year, and during that year I also decided I'm going to volunteer to get experience, but I'm not going to volunteer one-on-one, -on -one. I'm going to make a change. So I wandered over to the County Human Services Department and volunteered to be on the County Human Services Committee, and went around to different uh, nonprofits in the Valley and doing some mentoring for them on what I'd learned in Denmark. And I learned how things, decisions were made politically for funding of human service agencies. And learned about how to do, what, what, what did the administrators of those different departments do until I finally got my first management job, which was a director of Helpline. At that time, Helpline was, had been started by some uh, VISTA volunteers year, several years before, but it was pretty much a hippie kind of organization. And when I took over as the director of my first management job, I made $400 a month. And the bookkeeping department was a pencil and a piece of paper. At Helpline, 
We also were, were the Rape Crisis Council. We sponsored the Rape Crisis Council, and we used to be the, fun, the phone call, the phone answering service for, for the Boone Dunn House was started, and Rosemary Dunn Dalton was doing her things. And so we were involved with that through Helpline by, by get, helping that get started as well. But yeah. I wasn't primarily doing that. When we also had a thing called Help Squad, which would, was dealing with the first cases of, of drug stuff at, at concerts and things like that, and Help Squad when people were overdosing and nobody was paying much attention to those things. Our volunteers were out. We were going out and providing, going into the domestic violence situations and helping women escape, and, and we were involved in that when I was at Helpline as well. You know, going into scary situations, but just doing what needed to be done. People that needed help, you just, I, I don't know, I think I just was the way I was raised and grown up that you just do it. So at Helpline, uh, I started seeing what was going on and I was seeing that the county commissioners, county board of commissioners, and the county budget committee were making decisions about where money was going or not going in human services. And I also learned that the Ashland City Council was not putting any money into human services, even though they were getting uh, Title 20 block grants. And I learned about Title 20 block grants, and so I looked those up at the library, and I saw that they're supposed to, uh, to be, they don't have to go just for administrative stuff for the cities, they can go for housing, and they can go for social services. So I organized a group of people uh, that I'd met through my helpline work and other agencies, and we w went in mass to one of the budget meetings, the city council, city of Ashland budget committee hearings, and started talking about what we needed, what they needed to do. Was they had to give start giving some money to human services, and they never had given any budget, city budget money to human services. And I remember that we got money for the first time. Jackson County um, was. Uh, the uh, legal aids, Jackson County legal aid got the money for the first time from the Ashland City Council after what we did. And what I did is I figured out a strategy and I gave each person a, a piece of paper saying which order they were going to speak to and what issue they were going to speak to so that we weren't all saying the same thing over and over. So we had it all strategized what we would say. And we were very successful. And also during that time, I remember Nancy Peterson ended up being in the City Council. She and I were uh, approached by the Democratic Party of Oregon. They actually flew down, some guys flew down from, from Portland and Salem to the Medford Airport and met Nancy Peterson and I in the, in the, at a restaurant in the, Ash, the Jackson County Airport trying to talk one of us into running for state legislature. And Nancy Peterson did. So the same group of women that had learned how to be, do political stuff, we've been learning that, helping each other learn that stuff. Uh, she, uh, Nancy Peterson ended up running and winning. And another time, Nancy Peterson had two girls, and I, she remembers Nancy would tell me that one of her daughters said, we were talking about the mayor, the mayor of Ashland, there had been a long time mayor of Ashland, there had never been a woman mayor of Ashland. And we said, well, what are we going to do about this? And Nancy Peterson's little girl said, well, mommy, girls can't be mayor. And we said, well, wait a minute, maybe girls can. So I had been learning some things in with through my human services volunteer work and through now and through the consciousness raising group and I got up my courage to run for mayor of Ashland and I was the first time a woman had ever run for mayor of Ashland I was a first then let alone never being a mayor there there was never one woman even run for mayor of Ashland it was a good opportunity because um, the mayor, the longtime mayor was was uh, was not going to run so there was an open seat so seven of us running and I almost won. I came in second, but there was another liberal, Jim Sims and I, so we kind of split the, the liberal vote. So a very handsome, retired conservative gentleman who had been an executive with GE or something won. And, um, Gordon Medeiros won, he won first prize, but I almost won. And this, the, uh, the next election, a, a woman ran again and did not win, but the next election after that, a, a woman ran and did win. Yeah. And, and Kathy Golden Shaw was able to win finally for the first time, but, but I set the groundwork for that. And through the various women's activities, I had learned to, to do um, speak in public, to ask for money, 
to strategize, to s understand how these political decisions were made. And so that's where I got my courage up to doing that, saying this is possible. And as part of uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, we really worked hard on the Equal Rights Amendment, really, really hard on that. And we actually were able to get the Jackson County Board of Supervisors to boycott Arizona because Arizona was one of the states that was refusing to sign the equal, approve the Equal Rights Amendment. And there was a judge uh, in Jackson County who wanted to go to Arizona for a judge's conference. And we were able to convince the Jackson County commissioners not to, to, not to pay his way to do that. And coincidentally, at that time, we had two women, two out of three women county commissioners. Two of the, th two of the three county commissioners in Jackson County were women, Isabel Sickles and Carol Doty. And that was pretty exciting. And uh, we all became friends and were encouraging each other because women who are in political power and in positions of power in Southern Oregon needed support from other women because it wasn't always a pleasant environment to be in. One thing the county commissioners did is they created a Jackson County Commission on the status of women. That was a first. And that was because of the work we all did together to do that. And as, uh, back to the Equal Rights Amendment, what we learned about, we practiced how to talk to the media, when, what to do when you get interviewed, and how you, the people who are wanting to get news stories will sometimes trick you. They will tell you the sort of things they're going to ask you, and then when the camera starts rolling, they end up asking you something else. And so we learned how to never go by ourselves, to always go with two of us in teams, and to have the other one making signals in the back who wasn't on camera, telling us that you don't have to answer that question or, or just do a broken record technique. Some of the techniques we learned in consciousness raising, broken record techniques, saying just to say the same thing over and over to not get pulled into getting angry on the, on the, when the TV is, is running. And I remember when I was interviewed once for, about the Equal Rights Amendment, the, the reporter did that to me and then talks about, isn't it awful about, we won't be able to have toilets that are just for men or toilets for women, we'll have to have unisex toilets. And they, they were not able to suck me into looking stupid to answer that kind of question because we'd been practicing that together. I had also, uh, we had learned, Nancy Peterson and I were were very involved in, in now at the time, and she was also busy working with uh, Sheila Drescher and two other women who met in my backyard at a party one day. The, the women met together and started talking about what they wanted to do because their husbands all were working and their ch children didn't need them anymore. And they got to get excited that they all liked books and so the idea of Bloomsbury Books was born at a party in our backyard for, uh, for Sheila and Nancy Peterson and the their, their two other women, Denise and the little Bloomsbury Books, which is now a wonderful organization in Ashland. When I was at manage, director of Helpline, uh, I, was, I volunteered to be on a, something called the Jackson Josephine Health Planning Council. That was a federal initiative to, because they were tired of hospitals all doing one in their MRI machines and all mounting their big expensive equipment rather than cooperating and having one big piece of equipment in for all the hospitals in, in a town or something. So when a medical community hospital or a, a nursing home wanted to expand, they had to get permission from the health, local health planning council. So I volunteered and was appointed as a, one member of the Jackson County, Jackson Josephine Health Planning Council. And one of the things that happened was uh, Jackson County had an old nursing home on 99 in Phoenix and it was old and they wanted to close it down and they wanted permission to build a new nursing home, Jackson County Commissioners. And I was able to convince the board then that to turn it down, which was kind of radical, and instead use the money for alternatives to nursing home care for the elderly, which is some of the things that I had learned in, in Denmark about how, my, how I had back to what I learned there. And I had also been appointed by the Jackson Josephine Health Planning Council as a representative on a 12-county board called the Western Oregon Health Systems Agency, which was meeting once a month in Eugene. So I was going up to that meeting as, every month as a volunteer, and I took the idea of turning that nursing home down and using alternatives for placement for seniors and disabled. And Western Oregon Health Systems Agency agreed with me as well. And then we took it to the state of Oregon and a state 
of Oregon was, we convinced the state of Oregon that they should create um, a, a research project, and they did. And Oregon ended up getting the first, very first wa Medicaid waiver for Title 19 in the entire country to use Title 19 Medicaid funds, which at that time only funded nursing home placement, no funding for foster homes, adult foster homes, home delivered meals, transportation, in-home care, homemaker services, the kind of things that I knew really would keep people at home rather than in a nursing home. And that was about in 1976 and 77. And so that was pretty radical ideas then. At that time, there were, no, there were two adult foster homes in all of Jackson County. And I knew that because when I worked for the VA in White City as a social worker from 72 to 75 when we first came here, that I, would, I, opened up, I got arranged to have some um, adult foster homes and nursing homes licensed for the VA. And at that time I learned more about how there was hardly any services other than institutions for seniors and disabled people here. And it was because of the funding back to my first supervisor in Los Angeles who taught me about follow the money, follow the money, who's making the decisions. And the people making those decisions were the ones, were the politicians. So Oregon got the, this research program and then they hired me, state of Oregon hired me to be the research coordinator in Southern Oregon. So this research project was in five counties in Southern Oregon, Josephine, Jackson, Coos County, Curry County, and Douglas County. And they, the researchers were the big, big muckety mucks. They were in Salem at the Department of Human Resources. And I was all by myself in Southern Oregon. And they gave me a state car and an office in a state office building in Medford and said, make it happen. So I went around and worked with um, county commissioners, boards of health, hospital discharge planners, casework, state caseworkers, area agency on aging directors who were getting money through the Old Americans Act. So there were two funding sources. There was the Old Americans Act funding source and there was a, was a Medicaid funding source, a Title 19 funding source, but they didn't talk to each other and didn't work together. So I got both those federal funding sources and state funding sources working together. One of the, re I didn't start this, but the Oregon Project Independence, OPI, was, had just been started at that time. But there was nothing similar for Medicaid people. And I, I did things like uh, seminars and TV shows and educational things and getting people talking together to try to plan better for avoiding nursing home placement, if at all possible which is what people wanted. They wanted to be in their own home and stay at home, but it's not what was happening because there was no funding for it. Well, we were so successful that in 1980, the legislature created a whole new state agency called the Oregon State Senior Services Division, SSD, the Senior Services Division, which was created out of a combination of the Older Americans Act money and the Medicaid money. It was kind of complicated putting these two divergent systems together, and my job was to teach people how to do that. So the state of Oregon, after they created the Senior Services Division in 1980, they hired me and a social worker from Eugene, and the two of us went around the state of Oregon teaching other uh, counties, caseworkers and hospital discharge planners in other counties, what we had accomplished in Southern Oregon and why it worked and what the philosophy of deinstitutionalizing seniors and using the money and we we actually ended up costing the state the state federal taxpayers less money for more care and i'm very proud of that uh, it became known as the oregon model of long-term care and to this day oregon the state of oregon has more seniors in home-based care community-based care percentage-wise than any other state of the 50 states, and Oregon has the least number of seniors and disabled in nursing home placements. There are fewer nursing home beds now in Jackson and Josephine counties than there were when we started, and yet the senior population has really increased a lot. There were 
assisted, livings did not, assisted living facilities did not exist because there was no funding source for them. Uh, so a woman, um, uh, Karen Brown Wilson in, in Portland, uh, figured out how to do that and I was I would travel to Portland and Salem and help write the first rules for for licensing of assisted living facilities in Oregon and now there now so there are now I don't know how many fo adult foster homes there are in southern Oregon at least a hundred adult foster homes there's all sorts of agencies there's geriatric care, care managers there's homemaker agencies there's home health there's hospice uh, there's just all sorts of things that didn't exist before because you follow the funding source and convince the convince through dollars the politicians to do what they should have been doing all along. So all of that gave rise to this? To Mountain Meadows because I was I was traveling all the time I was I was on the road all the time in my state car going to Coos Bay and Klamath Falls and dealing with horrible elderly abuse cases and union grievances and employees that state employees that, that didn't particularly want to do what I wanted them to do and I said this is not my where my heart is why isn't anybody building some places for seniors and disabled people using my value system why is why aren't there anything like that here and so I talked to my husband about it and we said well maybe we could try that so I looked around and found um, while well, I was well, I had a really good state really good state job at that point I was in 1995 96 I was uh, region manager for the state senior services division very high level and well paid good benefits state job but I was still traveling all the time and so I I said well what do I need to learn so I started I, I need to learn about property so I started going to the library again again and said how can you how can you be a developer how can you do develop real estate when you don't have any money which we just we had only our jobs we didn't have anything other than that my husband and I so I found a realtor who told me about this piece of land in Ashland been for sale for several years nobody wanted it it was 22 acres but it was in the city limits of Ashland, but it didn't have sewer, it didn't have zoning, it didn't have paved road, but it was in the city limits. And I had learned way back in my planning days uh, in Ashland that uh, y if you read all the rules, you can figure stuff out. So I, I was a good government employee. I know how to read rules and how to read documents and CCNRs and legislative stuff and administrative rules. So I, I read it up and I said, well, if it's in the city limits, I can figure out how to bring it in the city limits. I mean, it's in the city limits, but it doesn't have sewer. She says, sewer is pretty basic, so you got to start with sewer first. So I said, oh, how do you form, how do you get sewers? Well, you form a local, a local improvement district, a LID. So I said, okay, I guess I'll form a local improvement district for sewers. And this area out here where Mountain Meadows is, from the Bear Creek Bridge up to Interstate 5, Mountain Avenue was a dirt road. They used to plow it. It couldn't even you know, grade it. Or, Pave it. It was just plowed with a plow because that's all the dirt. It was just full of potholes and dirt. And the, the houses, the few houses, there was only six or eight houses out here, and none of them had sewer system. They all had septics. Actually, the land that I bought ended up. <laughs> I didn't even have a septic. We never did find a septic tank here. I think the people who lived in a funny little house here was here before. Never even had a septic. But it took me. It took me two years to figure to convince the, the neighbors out here that we should sign for a local improvement district, which we did. So I learned about how you figure where the sewer was, and I learned. I hired engineers, and we surveyed it. And we they laid out a, where sewer would go, and I got 100% of the landowners to agree to this local improvement district for the sewer. And then I took another two years to figure out the zoning, and when uh, there was no zone. The right zoning wasn't here for what I wanted. I wrote my own zoning. I wrote a senior, I created a senior zone, and I wrote several pages of a senior zoning. And in front of the planning commission, they decided to uh, go with a zoning called healthcare zoning, which I already had, which would allow what we wanted to do with Mountain Meadows. And I was still only thinking about a few houses. And I got the land because I'd also read 
in that library book about how can you be a developer when you don't have any money is it said well ask the person who owns the land to wait for their money until you get it all figured out how to do it so I wrote a letter to the lady who owned the land it had been in her, her family a long time she lived in Nevada at the time and there was nothing here except a, a junky old house and seven junk cars and dirt and barbed wire fencing and rolls and just nothing it had never even been farmed and I said, well, you wait six years for your money. And this is what I want to do. I sent her our credit report and our resumes and said, we have no debts. We have good government jobs, but this is what I want to do. Will you wait six years for your money? And my realtors laughed and said, nobody's going to wait six years for the money. I'm not even going to show that to her. Well, I said, the book also said that realtors have to present all offers. And here's an offer. I've written it out. I want you to present it to the woman who owns the property. She said, okay. So he did. And she accepted. She said, I said, we'll just, we'll just um, accumulate in an account how much, we'll, each, each year we'll accumulate how much the interest would be, and I'll pay you. And we were able to pay her out of the first construction draw from a bank six years later when we got a bank loan to pay Mountain, North Mountain Avenue and the first sewer, put in the first sewer and, and paid Nepenthe Avenue, which, Nepenthe Road, which was the first street where we started with a single family house. So we got, we had a bank loan to do that first paving and build a model home and that's how, and I was able to pay her back and I was able to buy the 22 acres from from Bear Creek all the way up to I-5 on this on the east side of North Mountain Avenue for I think I paid about $165,000 for it in 27 years ago something like that and that's how Mountain Meadows came about I was 50-50 partners with Builder and 27 years later, it's all done. There's a $3 million clubhouse, which we gave to the community. And there's 65 single family detached homes. There's 161 condominiums, all part of the Mountain Meadows community. We also built Skylark Assisted Living, which is what had 75 apartments for licensed assisted living and a 30, 32 or 22 assisted living beds. I can't remember it now. And my actually, my father ended up living there until well, he died when he got dementia. And we eventually, my husband and I eventually sold Skylark Assisted Living uh, to a firm, another firm. It, it's not part of Mountain Meadows. And then we were able to use that money to fund the. Um, Exercise gym, which we're sitting in today, which is now serving as an exercise center and a, a support center and educational center for people with Parkinson's in the Rogue Valley. And that's where we're sitting today. Because 13 years ago, I found out that I had Parkinson's disease. It's been 13 years now. I'm now 78 years old. And my Parkinson's is progressing very, very slowly. And a lot of it has, to, almost all of it has to do with the kind of exercise that I've been able to do that I've learned about through going to retreats and some national places and it really works and I'm encouraged I'm hoping to pass along my passion for how forced exercise can slow the progression of Parkinson's for myself and for other people like me who might have realized thinking that it's it's not it is a it is a chronic disease it has no cure it cannot be cured but it can be slowed down if you take control and I've just put everything that I've learned over the years into my current passion, which is now 905 Skylark Place and helping people with Parkinson's. No, it was hard. Oh no, there have been many, many times when we couldn't make payroll here at Mountain Meadows and we're, we, were, uh, we had s some news stories that were untrue and there were lies but you once you get in the newspaper you somebody think believe something that they see in the newspaper that they believe it even if it's a lie you can't how do you how do you undo a lie you just I, I learned how to pick my battles I learned how to keep my own counsel and be cautious uh, I'm still trusting I've been taken advantage of financially by other people big time 
but it never stopped me and I'm still here and I'm still going. I think it was my Norwegian upbringing of a family, a working class family, who just, whatever happens, you just helped each other and kept going. You, you did whatever you needed to do. And I watched my mother and father. My father was an exterminator in San Francisco. My mother drove a school bus for handicapped children. My best friend in high school was handicapped. She had cerebral palsy. I learned about handicapped kids when I was, people when I was 16 and we, she and I would go to dancers or we would go to San Francisco to go to, to a movie or, or to the park and, and she couldn't go where I could go. I learned, I've been advocating for, that nobody should be institutionalized because of mobility issues from, from my earliest days. My, my, big, my biggest mentor in high school was uh, Leo Ryan. Leo Ryan was a congressman who was assassinated by the, in the Jim Jones Kool-Aid suicide Kool-Aid thing in, in, in Africa. And he, Leo Ryan ended up being a congressman and being assassinated there. He was my high school English and social studies teacher. And he taught me and the other kids at Cappuccino High School in San Bruno about, about another way of looking at life besides just the way we were and being caring for everybody. Yeah. He was a wonderful man. He was one of my mentors. When I was in high school, the girls could only take, the girls could only do swimming in the, when it was cold and it was dark about five, four or five at night because the boys got the best time in the swimming pool and whatever, whatever was going on in sports, the boys always got the best of everything and the girls didn't. And I never could figure that out. That just, it didn't seem fair. And I, I never was, the girls never did any competitive kind of sports. And so I never had that, what you learn about being in a team that's competitive and the kind of things that men, boys would learn that would, they would take on and how, then when you go into business and politics and government later, those are the games that they learned how to play that girls didn't learn how to play. Girls learned how to be, don't, don't speak unless spoken to. If you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. Be a lady, don't cross, cross, don't cross your legs, don't, don't, do, don't, don't do this, don't do that. Be good, be good, be good, be nice, be quiet, be seen and not heard. And I believed all those things until I started getting to older and bumping into these other things that I was able to read and, and get support. I've helped a lot of women over the years learn how to invest in real estate. And I have several friends now, some of the ones some of the very ones that were in the first Women's History Week group, the first consciousness raising group, the first group of us who were in the National Organization for Women here in Ashland and Medford, the first group of us working on the Equal Rights Amendment. Some of them now are, are as old as me or a little younger than me, but they have whatever's happened with their relationships with their partners. They have their own home is paid for. They maybe have a rental or two that's paid for. They're solid financially. They will not be bag ladies. They will be able to take care of themselves because they paid attention to me and came to some of the workshops I used to do for women on on how to financial planning for women. I used to do that, particularly around real estate. AARP used to do a, a, a financial seminar that Sharon, um, Sharon Johnson used to sponsor years ago. And they had all of these things, but they never had anything about real estate. And real estate is something that I learned how to deal with. I'll uh, backtrack when I said I had no money down. The way I did is I learned about tax deferred exchanges. I learned how the tax code is written to benefit rich people, not poor people. When I started making money by selling, fixing up, buying a rental, fixing it up, my parents and I would fix it up, fix it up and sell it, and then buy another one, fix it up and sell it. I never paid any taxes on that profit because I was able to do it a tax deferred exchange each time and defer defer the payment and so the, I did have some money to give the woman who I bought the property here at Mount Meadows from and it was about fifty thousand dollars that I was able to make that from selling uh, fixing up other places and still because I did a tax deferred exchange into buying this property I didn't pay any tax property any income taxes federal state income taxes on the money that I'd made doing the real estate I personally think that's a terrible law but it is a law so I ben I used it to benefit myself and what I was able to do here to help help others that way. Because when I was working, when you work for a paycheck, you pay through the nose. The same amount of money, if you make it selling stocks or inheriting it or through real estate sa gimmicks, you pay much lower rate. And no, 
people do not pay attention when they talk about the capital gains tax. That's the one that helps the rich people, not anybody else. But that's, we continue to this day to have a lower tax rate on capital gains, non-earned income than what you work with a sweater or your plow but for somebody else as a paycheck. One of the volunteer activities I signed up was for the, I was one on the first board of the Ashland Community Land Trust and then ended up on the, the Ashland uh, Housing Commission. And I watched the process of that and I watched project after project after project that was supposed to help be for long range helping for the housing s situation for, for working people and low income people in Ashland. And it, we missed the point that it was the planning actions that had the zoning and planning actions where people didn't want they were all for affordable housing, but not in their neighborhood, not in my neighborhood. As long if it was down the street from me, I didn't want it, but somewhere else it was okay. And time after time, there would be approvals for a housing project for a big a big housing project that was supposed to have X number percentage for for uh, for uh, subsidized housing or low-income housing or working-class housing, and there'd be some loophole, legal hope, loophole that somebody would find and the city would, would back down and the city would back down time after time after time. I could take you around town and show you places that were supposed to be low income rentals that are now condominiums. Time after time after time it gives in to the political pressures of a one issue issue. People, they never come back to the city, they just go over and over for their petitions and their hysterical letters and reasons why it shouldn't happen in their neighborhood, but then, so they get their way, and the city just tries again. The staff keeps trying, but the staff can't always buck the political power of the powerful people here. And there's some powerful people in Ashland that continue to be in power and make the decisions. And little pipsqueaks like me come in and through the side angle, through the side door, and we, we do make some inroads, but not not, all, not always. I do remember a lot about Carol Doty who was county commissioner and during the uh, all the time when the, the spotted owl things were coming up and, and cutting down on the ONC funds for the county because of, of not not cutting the timber and even though all the county commissioners were saying the same things she was the one that got recalled because she was a woman women are the tar can be the targets when I was on the county budget committee as a woman uh, some of the men just couldn't figure out why I was in a position of that kind of power. And it, and when, I've, when I watched women running for office, even the last one with uh, Hillary Clinton, and if, you, if the woman doesn't agree with you on one thing, she says one thing wrong, or she's one, one thing she doesn't support, then you're not for her. Whereas the men can make all kinds of mistakes. And you look at their whole pattern, whereas the women make one mistake if you're not perfect. Then you're against. When I was on the county budget committee, uh, the libraries wanted money, but and the human services wanted money. But so we still did also need money for the jail, and you need money for roads, and you need money for animal control, and you need money for other things. But I had some people that were mad at me because I didn't vote enough money for the library or enough money for human services. And you, you're, when you're passionate about just one thing, you don't see the whole picture. And I often, there's, there's one issue people, they'll, they'll show up for one thing, but not, not look at the whole thing. As a, and I, I somehow learned how to look at the whole picture, the big picture and the long haul, and knowing that the little details will get you there. And one step at a time, one foot at a time, and you just, things happen, but you don't give up, you just keep going. You just keep going. And I'm braver than I ever thought I could be, and I've done some, pretty stupid things that were probably if I'd been should have been more scared but I did them anyway and it was the right thing to do whatever's the right thing to do I, I've kind of been foolish enough to do that